Next up, we have uh, Dougal McTavish. Dougal's been a, 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 a long-term inspiring activist uh, in the Hampton community and in the Dunedin community. Um, and uh, you're going to tell us a bit about uh, what you're doing. Yeah, OK. Uh, Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I'm a um, water resources engineer and groundwater hydrologist, and I somehow got us distracted into this whole complex thing of sustainability. So um, confronting the growth paradigm, a story about Hampton. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a small town called Hamden. Its people were pretty much like those of most other small rural <coughs> centres in New Zealand. But in Hamden, some were worried by mutterings about peak oil and climate change and felt the need to find out more about these strange-sounding threats. So they invited three wise professors, a geologist, a physicist and a mechanical engineer, Susan Crumdick, to come and explain what was true or untrue. According to them, the, th the threats were real. Indeed, <coughs> um, the town, indeed the entire planet, needed to urgently address them. So the people of Hamden held a workshop and made a wish list of things they might do to make themselves more sustainable. Um, initially, the problems seemed to be oil depletion, and greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> so the folk could, uh, so if, if townsfolk could simplify their living arrangements to slash their oil dependence and become more self-reliant, this would solve both problems at once. And as other towns became aware of the science and the enormity of the risk people faced, this change in heart and mind would spread across New Zealand and the planet. And I would add that this was before 2006 and the Transition Town Movement. <coughs> the plan the townsfolk of Hamden hatched was wide-ranging. <coughs> Establish a farmer's market to provide an outlet for people to sell their surface garden produce, <coughs> which included one-off events like apple, apple days to celebrate taste and preserve old varieties holding more information forums and movies on subjects to aid change, establishing an information library and holding skills demos on things like food preservation, grafting and cheese making, promoting the idea of planting trees of all types for the longer term and helping the local school plant fruit trees and develop a vegetable garden, experimenting with cob building investigating in local electricity generation options <coughs> and organising an energy efficiency expo to promote things like windmills, water harvesting, home, home insulation, biochar incorporation, <coughs> smart electricity use and solar panels. They also set up their own recycling um, uh, trailer when their solid waste tender failed and they sent repeated submissions and deputations to their council about the urgent need to shift focus from growth to resilience and to develop a peak oil plan. But despite all this and a sense of growing self-confidence in the community, structurally things were much the same. Council submissions were largely ineffective. Perhaps most disturbingly, most townsfolk were still heavily reliant on private transport to shop, work and play, so petroleum dependence and net emissions were similar. They also depended heavily on supermarkets, partially because council bylaws impeded informal sale of local goods. Increasingly, it became clear that solving things was actually much more complex than simply providing information. There was an emotional dimension that was hard to pin down, but clearly, too, there was a powerful underlying economic momentum that impeded change. Hamdenites, like their fellows, were effectively trapped in an economic system that demanded material growth for its stability. At a global level, other disturbing scientific information was suggesting that the situation was becoming increasingly urgent. The UN was saying that by 19...
1965, the ecological footprint of human, humans began exceeding that of Earth. And now, <coughs> um, collectively, demand has, is overshooting the planet's capacity by about 30% and growing. Economist Herman Daly offered a simple model that crystallised the dilemma in schematic terms. He represented the global human economy as a square. This economy requires <coughs> um, inputs such as raw materials like oil, fresh water and soil and in turn naturally creates waste such as CO2 and nitrates. This is the classical economic model that it assumes there will always be raw materials available and always a large sink to safely absorb waste. That is, inputs and outputs are treated as externalities. However, there are also feedbacks <coughs> such as declining water tables and melting ice caps that can undermine capacity and efficiency. But most importantly, there is a large circle around all this called the Earth's ecosystem which makes both the sink, source and sink for the human economy finite. This is what classical economics does not wish to acknowledge. So given this closed system, the question for Hamden became, can the inner square representing the economy continue to expand indefinitely or will it eventually hit a wall? And if so, how soon? David Suzuki's now famous test tube example of exponential growth <coughs> and collapse of bacteria over a 60 minute cycle provides insight and graphs up like this. The key message is that with exponential growth, all the action is in the last few doubling times, as you can see on the graph and there is little forewarning before the food is exhausted. Now, if you graph up, graph up the world population assuming a doubling time of 35 years rather than Suzuki's one minute, as the global population has doubled from 3.5 billion since 1970, you get a graph like this, which I think you will agree looks disturbingly similar. So if humans have used up their test tube of food based on the UN overshoot graph just shown, then what are the chances of doubling the capacity over this current 35 year cycle? Suzuki is unequivocal. The biosphere is fixed and finite and every biologist I have talked to agrees with me. We are past the 59th minute of a 60 minute cycle. So all those leaders saying that we have to keep the economy growing are saying we have to accelerate down what is a suicidal path. That growth example is population. But most resource use and waste impacts are found to be following a similar exponential path. The population is in the top left there. Nevertheless, our government, and let's face it, most of us believe that growth is good and more is better. In 2008, Prime Minister John Key stated that the new national-led government's ministry would be focused on growth to deliver prosperity for all New Zealanders. But if the global picture is as we have described, why continually promote undiscriminating growth? If the economy must grow for stability, then surely it makes sense to be discerning and focus economic activity on things that will be of use in a resource-constrained future. So how do we shift such a deep-seated economic mindset? <coughs> In 1998, Donena, Donella Meadows proposed a generic hierarchy of means by which any system can be altered. The key idea is levers higher on this hierarchy, like belief and mindset, trump those lower down, such as constants and numbers. So why not confront this gross delusion at the mindset government level with a debate? The, the Meadow models would model, model would suggest that success would cause a cascade effect, transforming the focus of the entire system. So in 2009, Hamden assembled a formidable baiting team and challenged John Key to defend 
promoting continuous economic growth per se is a sound national strategy to ensure our fu children's future. When Hamden was unsuccessful getting him and any of his other ministers, they turned to the Blue Greens, the National Party, and the Young Nationals, and then other government parties, all without success. It seemed no one in government was prepared to defend their core policy. Eventually, <coughs> we had a great debate using locally well-known personalities for the affirmative. <clears throat> but Hamden was still not satisfied. It seemed to them that if any government is actively promoting a growth as good policy at the highest level, it is surely perfectly reasonable for citizens to expect it to have the courage to defend the policy at the same level when challenged. So they wrote again to the Prime Minister and proposed a similar topic. This time, <coughs> the National Party has agreed. Teams from Waitaki Boys and Waitaki Girls will debate the same top topic in a curtain raiser. Clearly, though, to significantly change thinking, senior government ministers need to be involved. Hamden has asked for this and awaits the government's decision. Thank you very much,